And good morning on this lovely Friday morning. It is Memorial Day weekend. You've reached Profiles and Perspectives with Darswell Rogers, and I am your host, Darswell Rogers. This is a perspectives show. We're going to be talking about something that is going to dominate the news cycle for sure for the next uh, several days, and hopefully it goes away after the next several days. Uh, which is this conversation about the debt limit or the debt ceiling, whereby um, Congress, in, in particular the House of Representatives and the President of the United States, are having a conversations about increasing the debt limit. And so I want to uh, take the opportunity today with, with my guests for us to break down the key elements of what the heck is this debt ceiling, what is this debt limit, why do we have it, what 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 are the implications? What are the legal parameters and and the like? And so I've got uh, with me in studio today uh, our chief economist, uh, Professor. Uh, I'm about to call you Michael. <laughs> <laughs> My bad. Prof Professor uh, Matt Dobra. Uh, uh, thank you for 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 joining us this morning. Always a pleasure. And we've got our new uh, person joining us, Mr. Wendy Vonnegut. And she is the professor of legal studies, and they're both at Methodist University. So there's been a lot of conversations about, obviously, the, the economic implications, but then there's also been these conversations about the legal dynamics, including this notion that, that the president can, ex can simply ignore the, uh, the debt limit because of the 14th Amendment, and there's more elements to it. But, but let's kind of start with the basics. I'm going to ask you, Matthew, sure. what is this debt limit, this debt ceiling that we're actually having this argument about? So the way that the government works, there's the, the separation of powers. You've got Congress who's allowed to say, this is how we're going to tax, and this is how we're going to spend. And then they turn it over to the president, and they say, do it. Right? So the, the way that it sort of breaks out separation of powers, legislature legislates, they decide what the laws are, president executes, that's why he's the executive branch. He does the things that Congress tells him to do. He has been told to spend this much money, he has been told to spend, that he gets to collect a smaller amount in taxes. So on a monthly basis, it's roughly, he has to spend $500 billion, but he gets $400 billion in taxes. But he's not allowed to borrow unless there's a sort of space in the debt limit. And right now, every month, he's borrowing basically $100 billion. But he is about to run out of ability to borrow money. So he's told how much he has to spend. He's told how much he's allowed to get in taxes. But he's also been capped on how much he can borrow to make up the difference. And there is a difference. Uh, there has been a difference in the amount that the government spends versus how much they're bringing in in taxes. Every quarter since, I believe, the fourth quarter of 1999. Oh, okay. And so that would be the very end of the Clinton administration, just to kind of frame, frame yes. that situation. It might have actually been 20, uh, 2000, but yeah, okay. it's a very So end somewhere of between Clinton and Bush in, yeah. that, in that range was the last time that there right. was not a deficit. Right, and, and that is why we hear this debt ceiling thing brought up all the time. There have been seven separate times it has been raised in the last uh, 12 years. Uh, the biggest one was uh, Obama in 2011, mm -hmm. but it was also Obama in 2013. Trump had a couple of them. Uh, I think 2018 was the big one for Trump. But this is always in the news. It's always happening. Um, but that's where it comes from. It's that tension. So there. what's interesting in, uh, is that my understanding is, is that most countries don't have this concept of uh, a debt limit. Us in Denmark. So, so let's let's understand how this works. So, I'd be, be real clear. Congress decides how much money the the government w is collecting, and yes. Congress decides how much money it's going to spend. Congress decides that. Yes. So, if there's a deficit, it's because our elected officials in Congress decide that there's a deficit. Yes. Because if they didn't want there to be a deficit, they could wipe it out by changing the laws, whereby we had a balance book, which is what those of us who have normal lives mm -hmm. have to do. Mm -hmm. So now... It's hard. So now we're in a situation where Congress is... One, one, one part of Congress, meaning the House of Representatives, is saying to the president, 
you can't, we're not going to increase this debt limit unless you cut spending. But, but help me out, the way that I, I, I'm going to turn to you, Wendy, on this constitutional side of this, it, the way it's supposed to work is that the Senate and the House are supposed to get together and agree on what that is and then send that forward to the president. They do, and, and they agree on a budget every year, and when they agree on that budget, they know there's not going to be enough money. That's the problem. That happened, this all started with Clinton and Obama, and the problem is they knew that once they started this ceiling deficit that they could use this as a political tool. And in the Constitution, it's very clear that the president has to execute the laws of the United States. He took an oath, like you said, Matt, he has to execute them. The problem is the wording of the 14th Amendment. And what everybody is looking at is the exact working, wording is that the validity of the public debt of the United States authorized by law. That law is Congress. They're the ones who gave the budget. They're the ones who did all the politicking. And it, it goes on to say, it shall not be questioned. So we can't question Congress on how they determine this budget. But that one word, question, is what they're saying, well, you know, the president can't do anything. And what they don't understand is that the Supreme Court's already kind of interpreted this thought of what does question mean. And it was a, a case that... Let me, let me slow, slow you down for a second. Because let's go back and talk about the 14th Amendment and make oh, sure yeah. that we're clear. Well, the 14th Amendment was basically created after the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And it was created because the southern states didn't want to be held accountable to the debt that the, the Union occurred incurred because of the Civil War. But the problem was they were going to be held accountable anyway. And the, the Union didn't want the southern states to say, well, we're not paying that debt. That's your debt. So they created the 14th Amendment. Okay. And so we really didn't have the 14th Amendment coming into play until Clinton and Obama. I mean, I mean we really didn't. No one ever discussed it or talked about it. You know, I can tell you in law school, it was not one of the amendments a, a attorneys spend a lot of time on until someone figured out, ooh, we have this federal statute about the debt ceiling, and it was created in 1917. The current federal statute that we go under was redone in 1939. Okay. So you have this federal statute that was created in 1939 that things have changed now. We're not the same country. Um, okay, so, so now what I want to do, just to be clear about this, is, okay, so the, so, uh, the 14th Amendment, we created a, there was a, in the 14th Amendment, that the public debt of the United States shall not be questioned. You got it. Okay. So now you can go back to, you said that, what, so what does question not be questioned mean? mean? Well, there was a case, and it's Perry versus United States. Okay. And even though Perry lost, what he was doing the United States for is he had bought a bond. And the government said, we're going to pay you back in a certain way. Well, then the government went back and said, we don't want to pay him back in a certain way. And he said, but that's a breach of contract. And that's in violation of the 14th Amendment. You can't question. And what they said was, you can't go back and question how you did this. You already did this contract with me, and you need to pay me. Right. And the United States Supreme Court basically said, Mr. Perry's right. You, you, know, you can't retroactively go back and change the terms of this agreement and question it. Um, you know, you have to, if, if Congress entered into this agreement, you have to honor it. Wow. Okay. So we're here with uh, Miss uh, uh, Professor Wendy Vonnegut. She is a professor of, uh, at this Methodist University, a professor and director of legal studies there. And we've got uh, Professor Matthew Dobra. He's a professor of economics and accounting, also at Methodist. And we're talking about the debt limit, the debt ceiling, and what it all means. So obviously the way you have interpreted this question of this notion of the 14th Amendment, which says that the the public debt shall not be questioned, and the Supreme Court, how long ago did they agree to oh this? Oh, my God, this is like in 1930s. Okay. I mean, it was a very older case because he was upset because he wanted to get paid in gold bullion. I can never say it correctly. Right. And the government came back and said, no, we're not doing that. And he goes, no, I want my gold because it was worth more. And um, the government was you know, told you cannot retroactively change this. So, so uh, my interpretation of that is if I issued you an IOU, a debt, a, mm -hmm. a, an obligation, um, you cannot, future congressman, future congress or future president, you can't renege on that. If That's you correct. Will. You cannot renege. You gave me this note. You promised you were going to pay me. You have to pay me, period, full stop. And it's been reviewed by the Supreme Court. 
That's right. So how are we in, so so what is the great debate here? If we've got to pay our debt, well, I guess not all our debts are are, 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 are underwritten by debt, though. They're not all underwritten by debt. Right. So. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, in any given month, just to sort of stick with the same figures, yeah. the government is running up about $500 billion in expenditures. Expenditures are not debt. Right. Servicing the debt is maybe 10% of that. So the way that government debt works, so, so going to get a little bit weedy on what a treasury yeah. bond is, right? Yeah. You might buy a treasury bond from the government. So Dars, well, you give them $1,000. And that treasury bond might have a 2% interest rate. So you give them $1,000 today, and then every year until this bond comes due, they will give you $20. And at the end of the time, then they give you your $1,000 back. Okay? And so you're getting these interest payments along the way, and you get your money back at the end of the thing. So that's how the, the debt winds up being structured. All of those little tiny $20 payments that they're making on these, you know, trillions of dollars of bonds, that is the thing that they are in jeopardy of not being able to pay. That, though, is only about 7 to 8% of the budget. A lot of it is military, a lot of it is Social Security, a lot of it is Medicare, Medicaid. So, I mean, if you go down the route of saying you can't question the debt, i.e. you have to pay the debt, you could make a case, I suppose, and, and maybe this is a Wendy issue, <laughs> uh, constitutionally, of they can't, the president can't prioritize things. He but can't. he might be able to prioritize that over he, everything else. He can't. Else. And see, that's the whole issue. There's this wonderful legal scholar by the name of Lawrence Tripp, and he teaches constitutional law at Harvard. He's written several books. And I saw a great interview about this issue with him. And he and other um, constitutional legal scholars say that the issue is the ceiling debt statute itself should be unconstitutional. And that when they created that statute, that they created the constitutional dilemma that they have put the president in. He cannot create new taxes to help with this because that's power of Congress. Um, he cannot um, create new debt. Everything that they want him to do is really the authority of Congress to do, and that's separation of powers. So if he decides, well, I'm just going to ignore the ceiling debt, which that's what they're wanting him to do. Right. Um, that means, and, and they're calling it the nuclear option. In fact, I think that name came about during President Clinton and President Obama, as they call it the president's nuclear option. Then he is not following the oath he took under Constitution, and he's not implementing laws that have been implemented. And the, the ceiling debt is a federal law. So it puts him in a constitutional dilemma. And it's interesting because some of the constitutional scholars are saying that he ought to just pick the least harm of what constitutional law he should violate. You know, <laughs> that, literally, that, that's what they're calling it. And they're saying that the one that he should go for, which would cause the least amount of damage. And one scholar even wrote that, go ahead and do the one that's the least likely effect to hurt us, and one that Congress can go ahead and fix once it happens. Well, is which to, one is that? Um, they want him to ignore the ceiling debt. Yeah. They want him to ignore the ceiling debt, well, do the I, nuclear option. Well, well, it's interesting that nobody just came along and has challenged the constitutionality of the debt ceiling statute. And they never have. And that's also been written about, like, why did not, why has it, and the reason being, this was never an issue until, you know, politics got involved. And during Clinton, they realized, oh, we have this, this ceiling, this debt statute. Right. And, and we can use it to manipulate how we want money spent. And we can put the president in this corner. The problem is, Congress is the one who created the budget. They knew that there would not be the money that they needed. They send it up to the president. He has to sign it. Well, then he signs it, knowing full well that the money is not going to be there that they need. And so they thought, well, the way we'll do this is we'll do a debt ceiling federal statute and we'll limit how much Congress can spend. Well, you know, credit card companies put a limit on how much you can spend and they'll let you go over it because then they make more money on you right. on the interest. And that's the problem. No one is really monitoring Congress and they have put the president in this constitutional dilemma. So, so let's let's take a step back and let's talk politics and, and then the economic implications of this of this um, roulette game that we seem to be playing. Yep. Um, the, the, the United States of America is the largest economy in the world. The U.S. dollar is the currency that most world trade, or it's the, 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 the vast majority of world trade is done in U.S. dollars. It's done in U.S. dollars because it's considered to be the safest uh, uh, currency in the world. 
if you stop paying your debts, if people don't know whether or not you're good for the money that, that you claim you're going to pay back, the implications, not just for Americans who may not get their paychecks or, you know, or their benefit checks or their food stamp checks or the highway that's being constructed in your neighborhood or the bridges that are, we're in the middle of constructing or the, uh, uh, you know, all of the programs that Congress has, in effect, told the president to spend money on, mm -hmm. for them to then come along and say, we're not going to go through the regular process of negotiations with you. We're going to use this arbitrary ceiling, which you're telling me now is constitutionally questionable. Can we, can we all have conversations with our elected officials and say, why are you guys playing roulette with not just my livelihood, my savings, my retirement, but the entire, am I overstating this, uh, Professor Dorper, to say that the entire global economy can be negatively impacted if these people don't straighten this out? Is that an overstatement? I don't think it is. Um, there's a lot of things that happen if the government defaults. Now, I don't think they will, and I think that there's options that, that the government can explore that don't involve invoking mm -hmm. the 14th Amendment, and they can do without a debt ceiling compromise. So, so we can, you know, maybe talk about those okay. later if yeah, you want. Okay. Yeah, please. But, um, but I want to address your, your your initial question first. Um, pretty much every investor in America owns some mm -hmm. bond, right? Like, right. if you have a retirement account, there's government debt in there. Uh, if those payments stop hitting your account, right, that's going to be bad for investment. That's going to be bad for banks who have made these investments that are expecting that money to pay off, you know, people. So this is sort of a, it's like a keystone sort of element in the economy. If that thing stops working, uh, a lot of things might tumble in upon that. So, um, so, so let me stop you because I, I'm going to take a break here at the bottom of the hour. But I want to come back and specifically delve into this question of that, that you're that you're taking us through in terms of exactly what will play out sure. if if our elected representatives can't come up with a solution about um, managing through the money that they voted to spend. Yeah. Okay. So we're, we're going to come right back. I'm here with uh, uh, Professor Wendy Vonnegut and Professor Matthew Dobra. You listen to Profiles and Perspectives. And welcome back to Profiles and Perspectives. I'm your host, Darswell Rogers. We're having a spirited dis conversation uh, this morning. I've got uh, Professor Matthew Dobra uh, from the um, uh, chair of the Economics and Accounting Department at Methodist University. And I also have Miss Wendy Vonnegut. She is professor and director of legal studies also at Methodist. We're talking about the debt ceiling. We're talking about the challenges. It's going to be big time in the news here as the Treasury has has announced that they're effectively going to run out of money on June 1st. And that if, if, uh, the, if Congress and the President can't resolve something, there can be some fairly significant, I'll go so far as to say catastrophic potential issues that could happen. Um, and so, uh, Professor Dober, before we left, you were kind of in the middle of explaining kind of what that is, and I'll, I'll allow you to kind of pick that, pick that back up. Sure. So, um, financial markets really are highly dependent on the um, federal bonds, right? Uh, a lot of, most financial institutions are holding some of those bonds, so they're reliant on that stream of income that they, that they generate. Um, but there's also the interest rate that is on them. And the interest rate that is on federal debt is what is viewed as, in the world, the risk-free interest rate. It is, fe United States, specifically, federal debt is viewed to be the least risky asset in the world, right? It's going to get paid, period. If we create a situation in which we don't pay it, we start scaring off investors, people aren't going to want to borrow our money or, or lend us money anymore at the currently low interest rates that we're paying. Now, I know that if you're buying a car or a house right now, you're like, what low interest rates? <laughs> yes, our, our interest rates are not great, but they're still the lowest of anybody in the world, right? And our United States government pays the lowest rates of anybody. Once there's risk involved, that pushes interest rates up. And if you think about this in your normal life, all of the things that you borrow money for, the more risky that borrowing is, the higher interest rate you pay, 
right? A home loan is not that risky because if you don't pay it, they take your house. Credit card debt, if you don't pay it, they're not going to come to your house and take your, your TV, right? They can't do it. And so they don't have anything to back that up, that, that, that debt that they're giving you, that, that credit. And so you have to pay a higher interest rate on that. So the higher the risk, the higher the interest rate. And so if the United States proves itself to be a risky investment, interest rates are going to go up. And that's going to mean this $31.5 trillion in debt that we currently hold is going to get more expensive to pay off as time goes on. The other thing that we need to worry about, and you led into this uh, earlier, Dar, as well, when you talked about how the United States currency is like the currency that everybody uses in international transactions. What this means is that there's a lot of U.S. dollars floating around the world. There are tons of U.S. dollars sitting in central banks everywhere, right? And, and businesses are holding on to U.S. dollars. You know, Japanese companies, they're sitting on U.S. dollars because they want to buy things using U.S. dollars. And it's not even always stuff from America. They might be buying stuff from Chinese businesses using U.S. dollars. If those dollars are deemed to be not as valuable because the United States can't manage their economy, those dollars will come back into the United States. That is a recipe for inflation. So all of the things that the government is doing right now to fight inflation, and they've, they've done a decent job, but we're still at 4.5%, and we're probably, I don't see that getting much better very soon, right? Money coming back into the U.S. economy will put strong upward pressure on prices because inflation is basically how much money is chasing the amount of goods that are being produced. Mm -hmm. If more money comes in, you get inflation. So that's the concern for America is that if this goes down uh, in, in a really ugly way, we might see all the work to sort of rein in inflation undone, uh, and, and I would say even worse than the 9% we saw last year. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, the question around inflation simply means that you're going to pay higher rates for things. So just uh, yep. make sure the audience is, is able to track that. Uh, I can't characterize this argument any more clearly in my mind as sheer stupidity. Mm -hmm. uh, um, it is sheer stupidity to take this approach. Uh, I want us to all look and talk about our elected officials. Okay, I don't care. I'm not, this is not, I'm, I don't care what party you're in. Uh, we are continually spending more money than we take in. We can't do that. Why do you think that the government can perpetually continue to take to spend more, more money than you take in? You've got one party that believes that you know any tax increase is some sort of uh, I'm, I'm going to use the word sin. That's not the right word for it. And then the other party believes to to uh, not support people who may be struggling or retirement to not provide them with things or to provide support the arts or provide support all these other things I'm going to use the same term as some sort of a sin uh, and so and so, but 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 the notion of a representative republic is that the is that you can't get everything you want you have to come together and negotiate a, the, the best possible outcomes based upon the conflicting or the differing desires, and you have to go forward with something that is physically responsible, meaning that it makes sense from the budgetary point of view. So our representatives, please let's not end up, well, my guy's right and the other person's wrong, because they're both wrong. They're both flat out wrong. Okay, I, and Wendy, I don't know, you got take here. Yeah, I do, because I, I keep hearing you say um, the term negotiate, and that's the problem. Since the Clinton era, in Obama era, the lack of tolerance with politicians is just increase. So they're not negotiating. It's all about them. And there's no middle ground and there's no tolerance. So even when they're doing the budget, they don't work together. It's either my way or the highway. And who pays is us, the American public, you know, because they don't realize that they were elected to do a job. And my problem is there's no tolerance and they're not negotiating. And I teach negotiations, and I will tell you that what breaks my heart right now is one of my favorite stories, and it's one of the best books for negotiations. Um, our professor, Michael Whalen, who teaches at Methodist, he teaches a class. It's getting to yes. And one of the stories they talk about is President Joe Biden when he was a young senator, you know, going over to Russia and negotiating with, you know, the Russian government. And here he is, this junior senator, but he was so well prepared, and he knew how to do it. 
And I'm not seeing that. I'm not seeing any of our politicians knowing how to negotiate you know, these deals and negotiating how do we work because not everybody is going to get everything they want. And in the book, Getting to Yes, they're like, we just need to get where both parties are happy. And I feel like both parties, all parties, aren't happy unless it's their exact way. And the American public are paying for that. This question of, of, of uh, negotiation and and getting to you know a, a yes comes the, the 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 political dynamic that plays out here comes to the way that our political system is structured. We've got a two party system. You have to, and if you want to run in the general election, you have to win your very your your party's primary. And the two parties, uh, in order to win a primary, the people who are the most avid or rabid. Participants tend to pick those people. Mm -hmm. So if you are a Democrat, the, the avid, rabid people tend to be very liberal. And if you're a Republican, the avid, rabid people tend to be very conservative. So therefore, they're winning the nomination to run in the general. So therefore, when you get to the general election, they are being pushed to the extremes. Mm -hmm. And if they seek to compromise, if they, in effect, seek to compromise when they get into the legislature, when they come back for re-election, the people who are more extreme are going to come after them, and because the extremes want their their way, high, way the, their way of the highway, they lose their well, seat per, per conceptually, right? Well, yeah, but this is where the American public, you have this wonderful thing called the First Amendment, freedom of speech, and I think a majority of Americans are in the middle. I don't think I they're do extreme. I really think they're in the middle, and I think that middle America needs to start voicing their opinion. You know, because I, I see all extremism on Facebook. I see extremism, you know, in other social media aspects. You don't see too many people in the middle. And I think it's because those of us who are in the middle are kind of like, ooh, if I step out. You're going to get hammered. You're yeah. going to get hammered. Canceled by everyone. You, so get, look, you're, you get canceled. By both sides. So, so, so I have a, I have, so um, I have a question. And since you're the legal representative today, I think that there's a good argument to be made, and I think we all have standing, to sue, to force the two parties to take down the uh, barriers to having other parties participate. The only way you're going to have that, it's not going to be a lawsuit. It's when the American public says, we are going to have term limits for office, because then we're not going to get senior politicians who die in office, and they're the ones, they don't even run their office, it's people in their office. And also, we need um, spending caps on politics. You know, I think that this So Citizens United with all the money flowing in is yeah, to me or something exactly. else. Exactly. Citizen, the campaign spending has got to be limited. Because I think you'd get better candidates. I honestly think, you know, if you, I mean, we all have budgets. And I know I can only spend this amount of money. If you tell each candidate you can only spend this amount of money, I think it would be great. Because then you'd see how really good they are, one, at budgeting. And two, what they really, you would open up the door. But right now, you have to have so much money to run, even our judges' races. Well, we had one of the most expensive races in North Carolina for Supreme our Court. Supreme Court yep. I've ever seen. And it's just getting worse. It's not getting better. Well, 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 well let me answer this question because I, I just want to push, because my, my theory on this is the reason is that in order to get on the ballot, there are certain hurdles that you have to cover clear. And it's the Democratic and Republican parties who have defined what those hurdles are, right? Mm -hmm. So they've made the hurdles so high that it's very hard for a third party to participate. Yeah. So I'm saying that, that the, lit the litigation would be is that they basically have a duopoly and they are basically shoved everybody else out from actually being able to have a voice. So that would be my legal argument. Of course, everybody that they would be going before to hear is probably in one of those two parties. So I don't know how it wins, but... But I just, I, I think that the corruption, it's like b b baseball or football or, you know, the NFL, yeah. right? They have a, they've got a duopoly and they continue to create barriers whereby you don't have a choice but to come through their system. So the political theory that sort of would push against that is that it's not the duopoly that's creating the duopoly. It is the fact that our political system is whoever gets the most votes wins is what generates the duopoly. 
So it's because we have what is called a plurality rule government where whoever you have districts where everybody votes and one person comes out of it and it doesn't matter if you get 10% of the vote and it's more than everyone else or 58%, right? The one, the one person getting the most votes wins. And any country or any area where you've got that political system, you wind up with a two-party system. So the two-party system is sort of baked into the way that the Constitution is written, unintentionally. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Nobody wrote it that way to create it. Right. And if you look back at you know 1789 or whatever, they didn't want parties. Right. They wanted no parties. There was no party until uh, uh, was it Jefferson yeah. said, "All right, we're going to be a party." They had the Federalists versus the the, the uh, Democratic Republicans. Democratic yeah. Republicans. Right. But there weren't parties back in the day. Right. It was. They, they didn't quite get the political theory, but I think the concern is unless you change the way that voting happens, have districts that, that sort of elect more than one person at a time, um, that's the only route to actually getting more than one voice or more than two voices. Or at even the table. changing, you know, the way that our Board of Elections is selected. Yeah. Whatever party is in charge, they get three representatives. So they're the ones who are deciding. Why not have you know, a group of citizens from one from each party and have two general people who don't belong to any party. Because we have been fighting our voting districts, my God, for how many years it's gone to the Supreme Court. Why? Because whoever's in charge, they get to they create gerrymander. the, they gerrymander. Yeah. And, and that's not going to stop until you change who is on that committee. And there's nothing that prevents us from voters saying, we want this change. You know, there's nothing in our state constitution. There's nothing in this constitution. So unless we change our committee, you know, representation and allow people on it that say we need to do it the correct way, it, it's it's never going to change. Matt, you're 100 percent right. But I, I think, I, like, I, I like that that idea. I think the problem is that most people think they're independent when they're not. You, you know, you yeah. look at you look at voter registration, and I think independent is is the number one. Yes, it's the thing, largest one now. Right, but uh -huh. but how many people do you know that are independents that would never vote? For a Democrat, or would never vote for a Republican. I know plenty of people who okay. will say I am independent, but they're going to vote straight ticket blue or straight ticket red. They're not really all that independent. Well, well what's notable in this in this uh, state is that there's a lot of Democrats that are straight ticket Republican voters. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we were always <laughs> North Carolina as Democrats. It, we were considered the conservative Democrats, and that's changed now. It's now the liberal Democrats, and I think that. You know, and then the, the Republicans have gotten, like you said, very conservative. You've got the extremes, yeah. and most people are not in the extreme mindset. Yeah. Um, you know, at Methodist, Matt and I talk all the time, and I'm like, I need to change it independent, because I've never voted straight party ticket um, until one of the elections, because I thought, this party's just going way over, but I wasn't happy with my selection. Right. I just feel like they're... I think it's sad in this day and age that these are our choices. There's some wonderful leaders out there, and I don't think we cultivate these leadership. I think it's it's the money is talking. Uh, so we're talking here with Wendy Bonica. She's the professor and director of legal studies at Methodist University, and Matthew Professor Matthew Dober, who's the chair of the accounting and financial economics, also at Methodist. We've been talking about the the challenges with the debt ceiling. We've kind of gone from defining. Uh, what that is, which is a construct of Congress to limit the amount of money that the president could spend, um, to looking at the implications of how this whole thing will play out if, if uh, at the moment the House of Representatives and the president can't resolve something that conceptually we're going to run out of money uh, June 1st. And then we've looked at the fact that um, the implications, because the United States is the most powerful economy in the world, that most trade is done in U.S. dollars, and if, uh, and if uh, the people around the world b believe that we're not going to pay our debts, we're all going to pay more for everything. Mm -hmm. and, and then we've kind of flipped into the, po 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 the politics of it, because it's the politicians that are defining and determining and creating this issue, where we're spending a half, a, a $100 billion more every mm. month than we take in. Technically, a little more than that, but yeah. Okay, for simple terms, yeah. the United States government spends a hundred billion dollars a month more than it receives in taxes and other receipts, and that is not a sustainable. And I, and we, I think we can all agree, you that's not sustainable. You cannot continue to spend more than a hundred billion dollars a month more than you take in and think that that's going to work. 
do do either one of you, um, and we kind of got about five minutes left, uh, we're, we're going to do the classic predictions, right? Okay, Wendy, what, how do you think this thing plays out at the end of the day? I am really hoping that they negotiate a deal. What I would like to see is it's not just Congress that's at fault for this. It's also the president. He signed that budget. He knew what was in the budget. And I think that we need, um, our prediction is politicians, the president and Congress, need to be held to be accountable for what they've done. And that goes back to election time and really quizzing and grilling them. But I hope that they will come to their senses um, and negotiate a deal. But I think um, Matt Dover's right. I think we cannot continue to do this. And I think that Congress and the president should be held accountable for the budget that they agree on every year. Matthew, your uh, thoughts on? Yeah, so uh, I think Wendy's got half of the story with the budget. The other half I think that needs to be brought up is the Inflation Reduction Act, which was very oh, yeah. bloated. All right, and there is a lot you of... You mean the, the Inflation Reduction Act, which was not really a, an inflation reduction? No, but it was <laughs> called that, so it must do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Um, but, but a lot of what they're actually fighting about is what is in there. There's a lot of corporate handouts. There's a lot of, you know, and it's corporate handouts for things that Democrats tend to like. It's corporate handouts for solar and, 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 and whatever, right? Uh, but I think that they're, I think they'll reach a compromise. Uh, the easy compromise is that there's a bunch of money that is unspent uh, COVID relief funds, and they'll claw that back, right? That's about half of the, the amount that they're negotiating over. And then they'll probably find some places in that Inflation Reduction Act where they might be able to pull a couple items out of that uh, that'll placate some of the Republicans, probably stuff that's sort of not as essential on the Democratic uh, list. But I think that they will reach a compromise, I would guess, in the next couple of weeks. Now, Next couple of weeks? That's my guess. So so you're saying that the June 1st is 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 a, a Trojan horse that uh, our, our secretary, tre our Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, who says she's going to run out of money next week, that you're not, like, buying that? No, I think, uh, I think she probably has a little bit more time than that. Um, uh, Deutsche Bank did their sort of survey of it. I think it was Deutsche Bank. Yeah. Um, and they're like, no, it's more like late June, early July that they're going to run them out, out of money. But a lot of the big financial institutions have said, all right, at what point are they actually going to run out of money? Uh, July is when they're actually going to run out of money. So, so then you're suggesting that the sec Treasury Secretary is playing politics with the number. Have you ever set your clock five minutes you know, I, I, ahead, I, so. I, I absolutely have never done. Well, I guess I have done. <laughs> I uh, think I think that's what she's doing. Yeah. It's setting that clock a few minutes off to convince everybody. All right, get your act together in time. Okay, so you know the, the the challenge with what you're suggesting is that the psychology of people who are actually believing that is that some pretty bad things could happen on June one. Yeah. Because of the fear, because that's a little bit of what I've heard that that this 11th hour crap just freaks everybody out and it makes it no does. sense. Uh, so listen, thank you. It's been a spirited hour. I truly appreciate uh, you guys you. coming in, uh, you. Wendy Vonnegut uh, and Matthew Dobra. Thanks so much. Uh, we're out for uh, this program. We appreciate and I hope that this has been proven very valuable to everybody. We'll see you next week. You're listening to Profiles and Perspectives with Darswell Rogers.